Hello, and welcome to Solo Quartet, an event featuring music and conversation brought to you by the Fellows of Community Music Works. I'm Mina Choi, Fellowship Program Director at CMW, and I'm delighted to introduce this event. Some of you may know that the Fellowship Program brings musicians to Providence for two years to learn about our ongoing experiment, integrating musicianship, education, community, residency, and social justice values. Fellows teach, perform, and learn about the ways CMW builds relationships and community. These musicians come in cohorts of two, one cohort each year, and overlap to make up a fellows quartet. In normal times, the fellows would come together in the spring to bring, present a quartet program, which this year was, of course, canceled. What you are about to see is the Fellows Quartet Program Reimagined, an offering of solo performances reflecting individual experiences of this time and how music has played a role for each fellow. The musical performances are complemented by conversations between pairs of fellows. They come together from different locations across the country to share an event that will hopefully open a window into the four amazing individuals that make up this group. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you, Kimberly, for talking with me today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the first piece that you chose? Um, so the first piece that I played was the Suite Popular Espanol by uh, Manuel de Falla. And I played this with my good friend Su Young, who is on piano. Um, and this piece is originally for a soprano, for voice um, and accompaniment, but uh, someone transcribed it for violin. So, yeah. Very wonderful. And what are the names of the movements that you chose to play? So we played the second and third movements. Uh, the first movement is called Nana. Uh, the second movement is called Nana, and it is a lullaby. And the third movement is Cancion, and which translates to song. Lovely. Well, we're looking forward to hearing it. Um, so what inspired you to choose this piece? Well, actually, Su Young was the one who suggested it. Uh, she frequently works with a lot of vocalists, and so she was familiar with this piece uh, beforehand. And we were actually planning a recital together, um, which ended up not happening because of the whole pandemic. Um, but this was one of the pieces that we had programmed on that recital originally. I thought it would be something really fun and special to play. Great. Um, so tell us about your relationship with Su Young and how you both decided to collaborate. So Su Young is actually a friend from grad school. So we both attended the San Francisco Conservatory uh, from 2014 to 2016. And she is currently in Korea now. So this was a global collaboration. Um, but we have been meaning to play together for a very long time. Um, and when this opportunity came up, I suggested it to her and she was very happy to do it with me. And then you also are presenting a, a second um, piece of music. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so this was kind of like a wild card, um, but uh, I do also sing. And so I decided to include a short video of me singing Stick With You by the Pussycat Dolls, uh, which is a pop song. Great, that's exciting. Um, cool, so related to your singing, when did you begin singing and what role has singing played in your life? Yeah, so I um, 
Yeah, I grew up singing. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say my family is particularly musical, but I was uh, in the church a lot as a child, and so I would always hear the church choirs um, when I was there, and that was just really inspiring for me. I loved that sound, and so yeah, I started singing in middle school, high school. I joined choir um, for all seven years, and then uh, in college, I. Uh, joined an acapella group um, at Northwestern called the Northwestern Troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very cute name. <laughs> Good pun. Um, yes, very punny. <laughs> um, cool. So how did you choose Stick With You? Um, so the other two people included in this video are my good friends, um, Josh Lin, he plays guitar for us, and Yuchi Chu, who is uh, a friend of mine from college. Uh, he was also a member of the acapella group that I was in. Mm -hmm. And so this was mostly Yuchi's idea. Um, he's been posting a lot of um, short song covers on his Instagram. But he particularly wanted to sing the song just because it was like a throwback to middle school days. And it was also just another opportunity to be able to uh, work with friends in a remote way while we're all separated. So, yeah. Nice. That's great that you were able to collaborate with them. That's wonderful. So how has music brought joy to you during this time? Um, so... I would say the common theme with my two videos is that I really try to reach out to other people um, and to kind of work with someone else on this project because, yeah, especially um, when we're all stuck inside our houses alone, mm -hmm. it's hard to find the kind of friendship or connection that you previously had when you could see each other physically. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I, yeah, it was just such a joy to work on both of these things with my friends. Um, and I don't think I would have been as inspired to do something like this if it had just been uh, myself. We're looking forward to hearing you play. And thanks for talking to me. Thank you so much, <laughs> Laura.
mind So I'm telling you exactly what is on my mind Seems like everybody's breaking up and throwing their love away and I know I've got a good thing right here That's why I say I must stick with you forever Nobody's gonna take me higher I must stick with you You know how to appreciate me I must stick with you, my baby Nobody ever made me feel this way Hey, I must stick with you So we're going to hear from you pretty soon a couple of pieces that you recorded for this concert. I'll, maybe I'll just talk about the the first piece. It's it, it's just a song I wrote, and um, I think it it kind of addresses the um, the intersection between between that that kind this. Um, sort of carceral and policing logic that that underpins how our society is right now and um the struggle mm -hmm. for immigrants rights and um an end of ice and ice detention centers those struggles are really interrelated and i wrote this song a few months ago um before the, these mass protests have really took off but I look at all this and I I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, but I'm so glad there's people in the street right now and I'm so glad for all the people who are working to make a more just world and we can't stop. I think we can be encouraged by mm -hmm. you know how many people are uniting together and banding together and speaking out for for justice. I just wanted to um, go into the second piece that we're going to hear from you. Now, this piece is um, Balinese Gamelan. Mm -hmm. And for anyone listening who doesn't know this about you, can you explain your history with Balinese gamelan and maybe even just tell us what that is for anyone who's never heard gamelan before? Sure. Um, so I, I was really lucky to have a chance to study in Bali for a year before I started my fellowship at CMW. And, um, and I was there mostly because I fell in love with Balinese music. So I went and studied there for a while, and one of the instruments I was studying was Gender Wayang, which is the instruments that you see in the video that I'm playing with my friend who also studied in the same village in um, in Desatunjut Tabanan in Bali. So, um, yeah, so... Um, the tuning is a little bit interesting. Like the reason why we're playing a lot of things in unison is um, even though we're playing the same note, the way the the bars are tuned to each other, they, it, it creates a sort of natural vibrato um, if both mm -hmm. of them are played at the same time, uh, cool. and, which doesn't happen if you only play one of them. So it really takes two to make it work. <laughs> so this piece is called Pakang Raras. It's a, it's a traditional piece that is um, really meditative and something that you might hear at a um, temple ceremony or um, just, just being played. Um, it's, pr it's pretty popular. And my teacher, Pak Igusti Katud, was telling me that um, that a lot of people misunderstand that piece because um, it's simple, and but he's saying that it's simple, but it's it's not simplistic. It's um, it's actually a very deep piece that he uses 
to meditate, to calm himself and clear his mind when he's, um, you know, dealing with any anything that's that's difficult. He'll he'll go to his gender and play pakang raras. It's a very beautiful piece. Both both the both of your pieces are very beautiful. Um, but before we get into those, I would just love to hear, you know, so we're both finishing up this fellowship program at CMW, and I would just like to hear from you if there's anything you'd want to share um, from your time at CMW, if you want to share that with us. Yeah, I think the the main thing that I want to share is just gratitude for um, the community at CMW, both the um, other teachers and the staff and all of the students and the families. Um, I'm just, I'm so grateful for my time that I had at CMW. Two years just disappeared like that, <laughs> um, which I. Yeah, I feel like everyone probably says that, but um, yeah, I'm experiencing that now. And I'm gonna miss all my students. Um, I think that's that's the hardest part, but I had such a good time. Maybe I'll just say I had such a good time with, um, with my group class, the Bamboo Puppet Time class. Um, mm-hmm. And I learned so much from the kids. I know that's kind of a cliche, but like, I am really hopeful actually. Like when I see, when I see the kids at CMW and like the generation that's coming up, like, like maybe we're gonna be okay. (laughs) This song is a prayer made in desperation for my country. My winter bird She cares not all for borders She sails the sky Across the gray dark water My winter bird, she seeks for peaceful passage, for four safe walls against the winter wind. And to my country came a frightened mother, and from her arms We took her weeping daughter We put her in a cell and sent her mother To distant lands Alone a ghost, a stranger My winter bird She cares not all for borders for us who kill with well washed hands and smiling teeth for us who care for comfort more than justice can never drink from freedom's cool clear water Thank you. 
everyone. I hope you all are well. My name is Lisa Saylor. I play the viola and teach at CMW. Today I'm also acting as CMW's resident mixologist and we're going to be making a drink to enjoy while we listen to the fellows final concert of the year. This drink is called The Works, which is of course short for the Community Music Works. There's two versions of the drink. One is for grown-ups only and one is for everyone. Hopefully you got the list of ingredients that went out before this, um, but I know it's hard to get to the grocery store these days, so this recipe is intentionally very flexible. You can make all kinds of substitutions and still make it really delicious. Um, if you don't have a cocktail shaker, you can use a jar. If you don't have a muddler, you can use the end of a spoon. So just grab what you need to make this drink, and I'll see you here in a minute. All right, we're gonna start out by making the for everyone version of this drink. Uh, this is really fun for kids to do, so I would suggest getting them involved. You get to smash stuff, so that's always good. So we're gonna start out by putting in a good handful of blackberries into our cocktail shaker. We're gonna hold back a couple of them for garnishing at the end, but I like to do maybe seven or eight of them right into the cocktail shaker. Uh, we're gonna do a couple of sprigs of mint right in there and again holding back a little bit for garnish at the end. Then we'll add in about two teaspoons of honey and the juice of maybe half a lemon or a little more if you're using small lemons. And we're gonna bash that up. So again, have kids do this if they're around, it's really fun. You wanna kind of crush the blackberries and bruise the mint a little bit so it gets nice and aromatic. It's very satisfying. All right. Now we are gonna shake this, and I know this sounds a little weird that we're gonna shake up something that's carbonated, but we do need a little bit of liquid in here to. Uh, get it going. So we're going to add just a tiny splash of tonic water. Um, if you're using soda water instead of tonic water, I would also add a little bit of extra sweetener because the blackberries don't actually add that much sweetness on their own. So I'm adding some ice to this and this is another really fun part. So if you've got little hands in your kitchen, uh, this would be a good time to involve them. Always make sure the lid is on firmly on your cocktail shaker, very important. So We're gonna shake this up until the outside feels nice and cold. All right, so you can see it's getting a little frosty on the outside, that's good. And we're gonna just strain into a glass. No need to double strain. Uh, if you get some of the pulp from the blackberries in there, that's all part of the fun. It's all good. And just get out as much as you can. There's a lot of pulp in there, so you might have to kind of move it around a little bit so that it, you get out as much as you possibly can. And then we're gonna top it with some more tonic water.
All right, and it's gonna get nice and fizzy. It'll settle in a little bit, but in the meantime, don't skip this step because it's also really fun, um, especially if you're a kid. So you're, we have to beat this a little bit so that we can get it to be nice and aromatic. You could try smelling this before hitting it. Um, it's not gonna smell that minty, but if you just hit it on your hand a few times, and then smell it again. It's gonna smell super minty. And I see the foam settling a little bit, so I'm gonna to just top this off a little. We'll garnish with our fresh mint and a couple of blackberries. And this is the works, the version for everyone. Next up, we're gonna make the works, the version for grown-ups only. All right, so for the grown-ups version, we're gonna start kind of the same way we did for the everyone version. In my cocktail shaker, I've already got blackberries, mint, lemon juice, and honey already muddled. Uh, and to that, I'm just gonna add an ounce and a half of vodka and a couple dashes of bitters. I like Angostura. You can use what you've got. And we don't need to add any additional liquid to that because we've already got the vodka in there. So we're just gonna throw in our ice cubes and give it a shake. All right, and then we're just gonna pour it into our flute glass or whatever fun glass you like to use. Again, no need to double strain. It's nice to have some of the pulp in there from the blackberries. Give it a little jiggle if you need to. All right, and then we are gonna top it with some Prosecco. I always do this too fast and then it foams over, so don't be like me. Pour slowly. Oh boy. Okay. All right, I did okay that time. <laughs> and again, we're just gonna bruise our mint a little bit. Give it a little smack. Put it right in there. Garnish with a couple of blackberries. It's okay if they fall to the bottom. And there you have it. This is the works for grown-ups uh, grown only. And that is the works. Cheers to all of the fellows and especially to Zach and Holly as they move on to the next stage of their lives. Why don't we just start off uh, by talking about the first piece that you will be presenting. Right, so the first piece that I am playing in this fellows concert is actually just improv. Um, something that I love to do at the beginning of practice sessions, just to loosen up my body and um, feel connected to the instrument is to improvise. So depending on, on the day, the weather, my current mood at the improv sounds very different, but it helps me to get in touch with just a pure place of music making. So yeah, it will be not an official piece. <laughs> That's really cool. I personally don't have that much improv experience. Um, mm -hmm. So can you just talk a little bit about what kind of role improv has played in your life? Like how are you introduced to it? And you talked a little bit about how you practice uh, or get into mm -hmm. your practice sessions but how else do you use improv? Nice, yeah, so my uncle is a jazz pianist, um, not professionally, but um, my uncle and his wife are in a jazz group together, and growing up, I was purely the classical violin route, and my uncle would always ask me, oh, are you improvising, or are you listening to jazz? And I used to kind of scoff at that, um, sadly, because jazz is awesome. Um, 
but yeah, in, in the past few years, I have been exploring jazz quite a bit more and just the concept of exploring violin and music in a way that's not perfectionistic, but is just freely um, playing the violin for the, the fun of it and the emotion of it. Um, would you say you have a favorite technique on the violin? Ooh, I really like ricochet, <laughs> but that's the like skipping bow. Um, <laughs> like a basketball. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like a basketball. <laughs> so, yeah, I like that one. Great question. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, let's move on to the second piece that you are playing. Um, yeah, can you kind of introduce that? Great. So the second piece that I'm playing is um, a piece by George Benjamin from um, a piece called Three Miniatures for Violin Solo. And I'll be playing the third movement, which is called Flower Lead. Right. So this movement in particular um, was a huge challenge. Uh, you'll see in the upcoming video that there is um, a lot of chordal pizzicato, um, there is soltasto playing over the fingerboard with the bow while pitzing with the left hand, and all of those um, techniques were fairly new to me, especially pizzicatoing while playing with the bow. Um, so my personal connection, I would say, is just I love a challenge, and I love feeling like um, like I'm first learning how to ride a bike again. Um, so it would be just, yeah, the challenge of it is the connection and also the beautiful, like subtle timbres and sounds that come out of, um, playing over the fingerboard and pizzicatoing with the left hand. Um, I just love that subtlety as well. How did you approach learning that? With the left hand pizzicato and um, right hand bowing. Similar to piano, I separated the hands. So I started by um, just playing the bowed part and trying to get that very like ghostly sound, um, very quiet. And another challenge to this piece is the time signature in that section is 13-8, um, which for any of for any instrumentalists listening, that's a, a strange time signature. <laughs> um, so yeah, just getting into the groove of that time signature with the left hand um, was really challenging. But after I got both hands feeling confident separately, I was able to very, very slowly um, put them together. So I noticed that you recorded both of your videos outside. So I, I love nature. I love being outside. Um, and especially sunshine, I feel like has a very uh, big effect on how I'm feeling and how free I'm feeling. Um, I feel like a lot of my classical music upbringing was indoors and almost very buttoned up. And there's a freedom in being outside that allows me to just express and um, feel like there are no, no barriers between myself and the violin and the world. Thank you. 
Okay, so the first piece that you um, are sharing with us is Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Um, can you share with us a little bit about why you chose that piece and what it means to you? Yeah, so the reason why I, I felt like I wanted to share this piece with everyone today 
Um, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot is a traditional Negro spiritual tune that is especially especially associated with the times of um, you know African enslavement in the South and the times of plantations and and all of that and that this tune was used as kind of like a code for the Underground Railroad. So it was a a tune that the slaves would sing when it was getting time to migrate to the north. And this tune actually got um, adapted by an African-American female composer, Florence Price, in a string quartet work that the Fellows Quartet performed earlier this year at the season opener concert. And this tune especially came back to me just during this current time of racial unrest and the Black Lives Matter movement and the death of George Floyd. And for me, just as as an African American and a and a woman, and I was just so angry and just so fed up and kind of didn't know what what to do and I, I was even just in a little bit of a fog kind of in kind of the first part of all of the unrest that happened and while I was you know just attempting to pick up my cello and practice one day and I just was immediately reminded of this tune to me it just feels really important you know as we're all kind of waking up a little bit more to seeing the world around us and to see in which areas are we you know raising certain voices and suppressing others and I just feel a personal conviction that I need to include you know the voices of people of color of my ancestors in my musical and artistic practice. The next piece that you shared with us is a movement of a piece for solo cello by Ligeti. I, I feel like this piece captures pretty much most of the feelings that I felt during this pandemic that I didn't really know how to express and I didn't know how to talk about it with other people but that I was able to find through music. The third piece that you are sharing with us is a movement of solo Bach. This particular movement which is the Sarabande from the C major suite. I mean this is a I don't exactly know why, but this is a movement that I have could probably just play for ever and never get tired of it. I absolutely love this movement and yeah, I mean I've I've played it for years. I played it for actually for my high school graduation, like for my entire graduating class. I've played it for before I'm about to do a big audition and you know I'm playing completely different stuff and it's just kind of one of those that I'll play right before I go on stage to just help remind me like why I'm a musician and why I like music. Is there is there anything that you'd like to say as we come to a close of our time at CMW as fellows? I'm so thankful to have just been a part of this organization and to work with the students and the families, to work with the other teachers, to just continue to explore what are the ways that we can make classical music socially just and what are the ways that we can think about music education and performance in an anti-racist framework, especially in this current time that we're in. That's a question that a lot of people are starting to realize. And I mean, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't happen overnight, right? It's something that really requires a commitment 
and just like a, a change in mindset and a lifestyle and really an unlearning, right? But I'm thankful that being at CMW has started to open my eyes in that way and really like makes me want to keep exploring that kind of work. I'm just thankful for the opportunities that I've had to grow as a musician and an educator and a person. I, I feel that my life is enriched just by knowing you and I'm so happy that we met and that we've had a chance to play music together and that we will again someday, so. Um, Likewise. Thanks.